So the next topic I want to talk to you guys about involves NMR, which is arguably one of the most powerful tools for analyzing reactions and, and molecules in chemistry. Um, so specifically, I want to talk about uh, NMR spectra of the final product and the reactions that we did in, the pre in this past experiment. Uh, the final product was 4-hydroxy-2-oxyglutarate, or as we called it, HOG, and has the following structure. And the main question I want to pose to you is how many uh, signals should, or how many peaks should we expect in the NMR spectrum? So the first thing we need to do is go through and identify all the hydrogens in this molecule. So we've got two here. I'll denote H1 and H2. We have another one over here called H3. And then we have one on this alcohol we'll call H4. And before we go any further, we also need to identify that this particular mo molecule has a chiral center right here. And because of this, H1 and H2 are going to be di-stereotopic protons, meaning that they each experience this chiral environment differently. So H1 and H2 are di-stereotopic. And what this translates into is they will have different signals in the NMR. So armed with this information that we have, it seems like we could just go through and count all the hydrogens, and that'll tell us how many peaks we should expect in the NMR. So we've got one, two, three, four. So on the surface, it looks like we should have four signals. Uh, but one thing we need to consider is what the solvent was when we ran this NMR. So for this, we use D2O, deuterium oxide, which is just water that has its hydrogens replaced with deuterium. And this is a slightly acidic molecule. And this hydroxyl group, or the alcohol group in your product molecule, is also slightly acidic. So if we were to combine these two, like we did in our NMR sample, call it ROH, there's an equilibrium that exists that results in the exchange of one of the deuteriums on the D2O with a hydrogen and replaces the hydrogen on the alcohol with a deuterium. Now, deuterium is NMR silent. So we would not expect to see this uh, deuterium alcohol species in the NMR. And as a result, we often don't see uh, these hydroxyl species in the NMR when using D2O. Uh, we can use other solvents that do not readily exchange the deuteriums, and that would allow us to see that um, alcohol hydrogen, but not in this case. So. We have to get rid of that, the anticipated alcohol hydrogen, so we'd expect to see possibly three with this information. But there's a couple other things you need to keep in mind. Uh, one is that the hydrogens next to one another will split the signals. And this is due to coupling, coupling of the nuclei of these protons, or hydrogens. And there are several factors that influence the magnitude of this, uh, of the splitting that occurs due to this coupling.
And this magnitude of coupling is referred to as the coupling constant. So of the things that can influence this coupling constant or how, how far space the splitting is in the peaks in the NMR spectrum, one is the number of bonds between the hydrogen. In, in organic molecules, this generally is um, J2 coupling versus J3 coupling. Uh, with J2 coupling, there's just two bonds between the hydrogens. So it results in a scenario where both hydrogens are bound to the same carbon. In J3 coupling, there are three bonds between the hydrogens. And in this instance, the hydrogens are bonded to carbons that are neighbors to one another. And just having this different number of bonds between the hydrogens uh, can influence the magnitude of these coupling constants. And another factor that can influence the magnitude of coupling constants is the relative orientation. And this can also be referred to as the dihedral angle. Okay, so we've got a couple things to consider uh, when trying to anticipate how many peaks we should see in our NMR spectrum. So I think we've got enough information where we can kind of start to put this into practice and try to get an idea of what we would expect. Um, so we'll, we're going to go through and look at each of these protons uh, at a time and figure out what their splitter, splitting pattern might be to indicate how many peaks we might expect to see. So we'll start with H1. So we see that H2 is, couple, or is bound to the same carbon. We know because they're diastereotopic, they're going to split each other, and they're different. So this first splitting of some magnitude is going to be due to H1. And H1 is also coupled through J3 coupling to this H3 proton. So we'll get further splitting due to H3. And then now we're going to go and look at this H2. This is in a similar situation as the H1, so we'd expect a similar type of uh, splitting pattern. So the H2 will be split by some magnitude by H1, and then split again by H3. Now we're going to move on to the H3. We can see in the molecule here that the H3 is coupled to both H1 and H2 via uh, J3 coupling. So one might expect similar coupling constants for each of these, but this is where that dihedral angle comes in. Due to the differences in the orientation between the H1 and the H3 and the H2 and the H3, we can expect some differences in the coupling constant that will allow further splitting. So uh, the first splitting by H3 should be by H1. Then we'll see uh, further splitting of a different magnitude by H2 in this system as well. So now we can go through and count all these up to figure out how many peaks we should see in our NMR. Nine, 10, 11, 12. So based on this information, it looks like we should see about 12 different signals in our, in our NMR spectra for our final product. So I'm gonna look to you to take this information and investigate the actual NMR spectra you have and see if this holds true.